Welcome along to this special episode of Irreverent, where we are going to be discussing uh, the most uh, important issue of the uh, recent proposals to introduce vaccine passports into certain areas of our society. And I'm delighted to be joined today by the Reverend Dr. William Phillip, Minister, Senior Minister at the Tron Church in Glasgow, Reverend David Johnson, Minister Emeritus at the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, and Reverend Paul Levy, Minister at the Ealing International Presbyterian Church in London. And these three gentlemen and I were amongst the principal signatories and authors of an open letter that was written uh, for the, for, uh, to be sent to the Prime Minister, and we also sent it to all MPs as well, uh, concerning vaccine passport proposals, which we wrote back in April uh, this year, 2021. And we're going to be talking about the contents of that letter, because the contents of that letter have become uh, increasingly important and salient as, uh, as events have developed. Uh, most uh, significantly in July, uh, just last month, uh, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson and the Vaccines Minister Nadim Zahawi at different points announced the introduction uh, of vaccine passports uh, for nightclubs and other crowded venues. Now, they very uh, helpfully didn't specify what uh, other crowded venues actually means, but we all have some idea, I'm sure. And so what we've decided to do is to reopen this letter, letter for further signatures from uh, Christian leaders and leaders in churches, and we intend to reissue it um, to the Prime Minister, and again, we'll CC in, as it were, all members of Parliament. So part of the point of making this special podcast is to encourage people to send this, uh, this letter, or indeed this podcast, to Christian leaders or leaders in Christian organisations, and to encourage them to read the letter and to consider signing it. And you can find the letter at vaccinepassportletter.wordpress.com, and that will, of course, be in the show notes uh, beneath uh, this podcast, wherever you're picking it up, whether audio or video. And so now what we're going to do is we're just going to talk about the contents of our letter and how they pertain to the situation at the moment. Um, we make three points, three basic points in this letter, um, which I'll summarize and then we'll speak through them one by one. The first one is that the introduction of vaccine passports is illogical and irrelevant medically. The second one is that it is immoral societally. And the third one is that it is impossible theologically. And as it pertains to the church, it is unacceptable. And so now let's talk through these issues. Um, I'm gonna to come to you, first of all, uh, William, because you, um, in your former life, were a professional medical doctor. And so you, have, you are well qualified to understand uh, this particular issue. And indeed, you've kept up with lots of the data and so on. Um, the issue around the medical aspect of the introduction of vaccine passports, its illogicality and uh, unnecessary nature. I wonder if you could kick us off by saying something about that. Yes, of course. Uh, thank you. I mean, it's very simple, really. And uh, we have to just be very clear about two things as regards uh, vaccines. Vaccines protect those who are vaccinated, not others. And secondly, that showing proof of vaccination does not mean that you are safer than any other healthy uh, asymptomatic person. And those are the two crucial things. Um, when the, the first trials were done back in the autumn of uh, the vaccines, they showed that they reduced detectable infections, but there was no evidence at that stage to show that vaccinating people would reduce transmission of the disease. There was a hope that that would be the case, but there was no evidence for that. Now, after many months of vaccinating people all over the world, that has been cleared up, I think, irrevocably. There's a mass of data now coming out of countries which have got very high vaccination rates, like Israel, like Iceland, uh, but also now data very clearly from our own uh, Public Health England and Public Health Scotland that show that, yes, the vaccines do seem to be, at least in the short term, highly effective at reducing deaths and hospitalizations. But at the same time, there is 
clear evidence that the vaccines do not make a person who catches the virus after having been vaccinated any less infectious than an unvaccinated person. And what we've been seeing in recent months in this country and in other countries as different variants have taken hold, particularly the Delta variant, which is the um, by far the predominant variant now, is that actually the efficacy of the vaccines against the Delta variant is much less than it was against previous ones. That's why we're seeing uh, large numbers of people still being infected who have been vaccinated, double vaccinated. And the crucial issue is that those people have been shown to have in numbers of trials exactly the same levels of viral load in their uh, nose and their mouth and their nasopharynx and therefore uh, just as likely to spread to others. And in fact, the hard data uh, shows that as well. There is no difference uh, in the infectability of others, of those who have either had the vaccine or have not. And so whatever that tells us about vaccine efficacy and all the rest of it, the one thing it most certainly tells us is that vaccine passports are entirely illogical. The whole rationale for them is that uh, if you, as an un, if you as an unvaccinated person mix with those who are vaccinated, somehow you are going to be a risk to them. So you should be kept out of that gathering, that football stadium or, or whatever it might be. But that is just not true. And in fact, there are those who are suggesting that those who have been infected with the virus, having been vaccinated, may in fact even be more infectious. Now, I don't know if there's really strong data for that or not, but that's been suggested by some uh, very well uh, 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 qualified people. But one can also understand that, you know, there is a sense, isn't there? You've heard probably many people saying, oh, I've had my vaccines. I feel much safer now around other people. <laughs> there's a behavioral change that comes. And, uh, and there's an argument for saying that those who are infected with the virus having been vaccinated may be more dangerous because mm. they're more cavalier. They feel that whatever they've got, I've got a few sniffles, it can't be COVID. Maybe even more um, dangerous therefore to others. But the bottom line is, if you're asymptomatic, if you're healthy, if you're going into a, a cinema, uh, a football match, or indeed a church, you are no more or no less uh, dangerous to anybody else, whether you've been vaccinated or not. And so it's entirely uh, illogical and utterly irrelevant. There is no medical reason for vaccine passports whatsoever. Mm. Thank you very much, William. I think that's very clear. I mean, just coming, this, this kind of touches on the second issue as well, but when we're talking about the morality of uh, this proposal, um, there's an issue here around informed consent, isn't there? Because um, as I understand it, informed consent has to be on the basis of a clinical need. And when you introduce things like incentives, or I don't really know what to call them, but, but threats, you know, you won't be allowed to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, this violates the principle of informed consent. Would you say that that's the case? I think it is. And I think, maybe, yeah, sorry, sorry, can I just say one more thing, David? The, the, the irony of that is that um, if you were to put forward to an ethics committee um, a clinical trial uh, using incentives of the kind that have been, um, uh, be, are being used in different parts of the world, free McDonald's vouchers, free cinema vouchers, Netflix thing, all sorts of things, ice cream for children. If you put to a, an ethics committee um, a study that was using that kind of incentives to take a, a, an experimental treatment, there is no way that that study would ever be um, granted. It would be, it would be deemed totally unethical. And yet, that's being rolled out in extraordinary ways uh, in our country and in other countries. So it, it's yeah. quite an extraordinary, unique uh, and unprecedented thing. I, I, was, I was just going to reinforce that, really, um, William. Um, one of the documents I had a, a look at um, was the uh, UNESCO uh, Declaration of Bioethics and, and Human Rights. And it actually touches very specifically on that whole issue of uh, informed consent and and what it it says in in article six is and it's very broad it says any preventive diagnostic and therapeutic medical intervention is only to be carried out with the prior free and informed consent of the person concerned based on adequate information the consent should where appropriate be expressed and may be withdrawn by the person concerned at any time and for any reason without disadvantage or prejudice. 
Now, it seems to me you could scarcely get a clearer statement of what informed consent involves, and, and, and it includes preventive, diagnostic, and therapeutic um, medical intervention, which, which, is, which is exactly what we're, we're, we're dealing with in, in the present circumstances. And I appreciate that these declarations are not necessarily legally binding, but further on in the declaration, it says that the states, and obviously those governments that are part of the United Nations, um, have a duty thereby to, to implement the principles in this uh, declaration in their respective jurisdictions and through their uh, respective legislators. Now, I mean, I, I, I don't know where, where that stands legally in, in, in our uh, you know, situation in the United Kingdom, but it seems to me that's a very clear statement and that however you look at it, it seems that, that the, the government is at least turning a, a blind eye to that um, it, by, by in, in, in threatening at least to implement the measures uh, that uh, are proposed possibly for September for later in the year. Hmm. Yeah. I think also there's this um, related issue of the relationship of our bodies, I mean, quite literally, our bodies to the state. Um, I mean, I think the world that we used to live in uh, would have said that we are in charge of, you know, what medical treatments we have. And, you know, mm -hmm. we have, a, we have a bodily, we have an inalienable right or whatever kind of uh, language you want to use, you know, talk about the European Convention of Human Rights or however you understand that rights language, uh, that we have some kind of bodily autonomy, right not to be interfered with by whomever, by a doctor or by the state, unless we give our explicit and informed consent. And it seems to me that with this uh, situation, that relationship is being fundamentally changed. And so um, lots of people would say, well, you know, it's just, it's just a vaccine and, you know, it, and it's safe and it's effective and, and, and so on and so forth. But I mean, even if one accepts those things, even if you accept those things, it's the principle of the state coercing and really mandating by the back door a medical treatment that you may not want for clinical reasons. And you may not be convinced, for example, that they are safe, effective and necessary. Yeah. You feel you have to have them. Yeah. Well, up, or up, up to now, yeah, yeah. Sorry, up to now, I mean, obviously, 65 year olds and above have been offered a flu vaccine, but there's never been any compulsion on them to take the flu vaccine. That's been their choice and they, some do and some don't. And I, I can't really work out why that principle has changed or why that principle is in any way being set aside. Yeah, yeah. William, did you want to? Just to say, you, you mentioned that there may be, you know, medical reasons or whatever for people not taking vaccinations, but I think within the context also of the Christian church is important to make the point, which we did in our letter, that there are people who for conscience reasons uh, do not want to take this mm -hmm. uh, a, a vaccine, particularly because uh, of the involvement of uh, fetal tissue in uh, either development or in testing of these vaccines. Now, not all Christians uh, share the same view on that. It's probably a minority view, but it's a it's a very honourable view. And you know, there was um, something in the press just uh, this last week, I think, vigorously um, promoting vegans' rights not to take a vaccine because of its um, association with animal testing. Well. You know, this, that seemed to go without question. Well, of course, they must be respected. But what about those who uh, have issues, not because of animal rights, but because of human embryo rights? Mm. It seems to me that that's a far greater thing. And so, you know, there are multiple reasons why. And in fact, you, you made the point, it, it's not really about what particular people's reasons are. It's about whether their body is under their own control or in terms of children under their parents and family's control uh, or solely under the control of state diktat and what david is saying there is you know is is very alarming because these changes are pushing us in a direction which is uh you know at the very least worrying and indeed you know maybe much more sinister than that and so i think there are very good reasons why people are alarmed with the uh, the the ethics and the morality of this way beyond just the, the logicality of the uh, uh, of the medical side of things, which even if there was a medical logic in it, would still have uh, all of these other moral and ethical concerns. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things we wrote about in our letter was the fear of creating a two-tier society, um, a medical 
apartheid, we wrote, in which an underclass of people who decline vaccination are excluded from significant areas of public life. Um, now, this, this is one of these issues which um, in some ways is quite perplexing because we live in a society that purports to be um, in favour of tolerance and completely anti-discrimination. Mm -hmm. But these, these policies which are being brought in appear to be highly uh, discriminatory. And, in, and indeed, exactly as we say, um, they, they endanger us um, because our society could indeed become a two-tier society in which certain people are excluded from great swathes of involvement in public life. And of course, we'll come on to talk about the church later, but this is a much broader issue than the church. It involves many other areas as well. Um, I wonder, Paul, we haven't heard from you yet. I'm un I wonder if you want to speak to that at all. Yes, I think that is um, a concern. So over the past couple of weeks, I've received a few emails from people within my congregation um, who are concerned about what it means for their jobs. They, in good conscience, feel that they can't have the vaccine and so um, are concerned about going back into the office and there's pressure being put upon them. I know one young lady works in... Uh, childcare as a nanny and was asked in the interview um, whether she had been vaccinated um, and so I, I think there is great concern amongst those within the congregation who feel that they can't in good conscience be vaccinated and what what it's going to mean and again it's kind of by the back door isn't it it's pressure put upon them uh, people are not being allowed to act in good conscience. And, and, it, and as ministers and as churches, we want to kind of stand against that, um, particularly for those who, who feel, and it, it, as William said, it's, it's a small minority uh, of Christians who feel that they can't take the vaccine, um, but their rights should be defended and we as a church should be standing up for them on that. Mm. Yeah, and indeed of, of everyone in society who, um, who declines to take the vaccine for, for whatever reason. Um, I think that's 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 part of the issue here, isn't it? Is that we will we will effectively have a you know sort of intermensch you know underclass of of people who will will um, yeah be ex excluded. I mean, there's not really any other way of, of saying it. And I do find it I do find it remarkable. Um, we've already heard um, we were just chatting before we did the recording. We've already we're already hearing reports of businesses and other organisations that are effectively um, mandating. Uh, vaccinations for their employees so this is becoming um very much a reality um do you, before we move on david and william do you want to say anything about that well our our um our church the presbyterian church in ireland embraces both jurisdictions the united kingdom northern ireland and then the uh, Re republic of ireland but we are the presbyterian church in ireland we, we encompass the whole island and and, and one of my, my younger uh, colleagues uh, in, in, in ministers in, in, in the Dublin area uh, the, texted me during the week uh, and uh, he recounted to me how he'd gone to meet someone uh, in, in a coffee shop and he said, to be seated in the coffee shop, I needed ID and also certification of vaccination um, or having had COVID. So I failed the qualifying test Thankfully, there was one outside table that we were able to use, leper that I am. <laughs> yeah. And that, that, is, that is how he felt having an, an encountered this very discriminatory practice that has been uh, introduced in the rubric. It's not that you, you, you just have to produce evidence of a negative test. It is you have to either have pr proof of vaccination status or that you have actually had COVID and recovered from it. So in, in the Republic of Ireland, they've, they've taken things a step further. Now, I think they would probably say it's a temporary measure, but the definition of temporary uh, can, can become rather extended. And you, you wonder if these things come in, um, uh, will they ever be entirely removed? Mm. I, I think you wonder though whether the the question of the legality of it all is is going to become um, a, an issue we, we've seen, and we with the Scottish Judicial Review, with the kind of government overreach there. I, I I have great hope that some of these measures, which are being kind of introduced by stealth, um, would be challenged and um, 
common sense, good law would prevail, I, I would hope on that. I think one of the things that's concerning is the government's uh, uh, hiding behind uh, others, not, not making a clear declaration on this, um, and, but leaving it up to private companies. Um, and you know, that just opens the way for that kind of uh, discrimination whilst being able to say at the same time, oh, it's not us, we're not mandating it. And I think that's an act of cowardice by the government. Um, and I think, secondly, um, what you described there, David, is, is awful and horrible. But what's even worse is that I think the way things are moving and with the, with the level of pressure uh, through, through government, through the media and so on, is that um, the, the opinion of the majority, the general, is being turned against those who are in the minority um, to scapegoat them, uh, mm. to say, well, these are the ones who are causing the trouble. If you're not getting to do the things you want to do, blame it on these people. It's it's their problem. They're the, the, the you know, it's not just that they're an underclass, but that they are a, they are a, a, a guilty underclass. They are the ones causing the problem, and that is very very sinister. You know, you don't have to look back terribly far into 20th century history uh, to see exactly where the roots of those sorts of things come from and where they lead to. Uh, and it begins with uh, a bit of cold shouldering, a bit of. Uh, um, whispering uh, under one's breath, oh, those wretched people, uh, you know, uh, we know what happened uh, in, in the 1930s uh, in, in Germany, and we know where it led. It didn't begin with gas chambers. It ended with gas chambers, but it began with precisely this kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, that, that last year I happened to read, before any of this really came along, I mean, I happened to read um, biography of, of, of Dietrich Bonhoeffer by uh, Eric Metaxas. Mm. Um, and, 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 and that was exactly what you saw. I mean, it, was, it, was, it, it just didn't all happen overnight. Um, mm. and, 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 and the thing that struck me in reading that book was how few there were yeah. uh, who actually spoke out against it. Yeah. And 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 Bonhoeffer, Niemöller, they represented a very small group of people, and in the end, they paid a very heavy price. And of course, Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, was executed just you know a couple of weeks before the Allied troops arrived. Um, but it, but it was it was it was it was quite chilling to read how all of that actually took root. In, in, in society and, and enabled what you've just said to happen. Um, and, and, and that's the sinister thing, I think, about all of this. Yeah. And another aspect of that was uh, just how prominent the medical profession were uh, and how much of the Nazis' dirty work they, they were willing to do. I read a paper recently that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in the early 1950s, and it was a, it, it, it was a very detailed survey um, about the medical profession in a totalitarian regime. Uh, it's, it's well worth still reading. What was very striking about it was, um, it, it made the point that this, this slippery slope began with very small changes, with very slight changes in the morality and the ethics of what uh, doctors considered uh, acceptable. And it was that fatal first step that ended up with the kind of uh, horrors that we're now all aware of, Mengele and the, in Auschwitz and, uh, and all the rest of it. But one very striking thing that um, I noted and that was brought up in this paper was that in Holland alone, among all the uh, occupied countries, uh, the medical profession stood out against this. Um, uh, they saw through uh, what they were being asked to do. And what they were being asked to do at the beginning was not something drastic. It wasn't take people off to camps and uh, experiment on their bodies. It was just very slight changes. They saw it and they refused. And despite um, all kinds of uh, uh, actions being taken against them, removing their licenses, uh, even some of them being imprisoned, they stood firm and refused to, uh, refused to do it. And that was the only country in, in occupied Europe where the medical profession did not come to become the servants of, of a horrific totalitarian regime. And I think that has something to say to those in the medical profession uh, in the Western world today. Uh, it, 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 it's very small changes. It's, oh, well, it's just a bit of doing this or that. It's, you know, it's just vaccinating children. Let's just do it. Well, we need to be very, very wary of slight changes in clear ethical uh, 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 practices because at, they can lead to, to somewhere very, very dark indeed. 
And just as uh, Martin Nimmler and, and these others were, were accused of scaremongering and exaggerating, I'm no doubt be accused of scaremongering and exaggerating for, for, for saying things like that today. But nevertheless, history is something we have to learn from. And I, I really think uh, in the medical profession today, um, and certainly in the church today, we have to learn from these things. Yeah. I think um, speaking of the sort of thin end of the wedge uh, issues, uh, we also, I think, have the, have the concern that this technology and its implementation, once it is introduced, will, will not, as you say, David, be, in fact, uh, temporary but will become a permanent fixture of life and indeed will expand and metastasize to encompass other forms of medical treatment and perhaps other things as well. I mean, it sounds um, quite ludicrous, but only a couple of weeks ago, we heard the government suggesting that um, they, they were go somehow going to monitor uh, our exercise and diet and give us rewards based on um, doing what they want, essentially, uh, living healthier lifestyles. It seems preposterous, but um, nevertheless, it, it illustrates this, this, this concern that the state is increasingly trying to take control over the minutiae of our lives. And, very, and well, maybe not even the minutiae, but also very significant areas as well. So um, this technology, I, mean, I think it seems it seems quite clear to me that it could, and that there's a very there's a very high there's a very high likely likelihood that it will um, expand to to involve other things, not just COVID vaccination status, but booster booster jabs, uh, flu jabs, and then perhaps even other forms of medical treatment. And then, of course, it could, as as I say, it could then even um, progress beyond that. And so what we wrote in our letter is that this has a, this scheme, this proposal has the, the potential to create a surveillance state that is uh, creeping towards a kind of um, digital uh, totalitarianism, which is extremely worrying. I wonder if any of you gentlemen want to speak to that issue. Well, I think, you know, as a minister, yes, I, I think you know there's been lots of talk of romans 13 hasn't there mm. uh, from churches and christian leaders the, the the role of the the minister and the role of the, the church is we, we are to pray for the authorities we are to submit where we can but but there is a prophetic role where, where the the church has a right uh, the preachers of god's word have a right to speak out to speak to the state and i think yet yeah, the creeping um, authoritarianism the overreach is one of the areas where we've seen um, over the last year and a half and the church certainly is a duty to kind of prophetically challenge that mm. and um, it's been sad isn't it the, 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 the voices of church leaders over this last 18 months where there have been times where they should have been speaking out to the state and challenging the state and really bringing God into the equation instead what we've seen is church leaders being health and safety officers and um hands face space was the mantra when, when actually there's been a right approach in this last 18 months to say well what is what is god doing in this what what is god saying to our government leaders um which i think you've seen in church history but but it's been sorely absent over the last 18 months yeah. I, mean, I i i think that's absolutely right one of the things that that, that has struck me particularly is the silence of church leaders it's not so much what they have said it's what they haven't said mm -hmm. um and that 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 silence is is deafening and i've 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 been trying to think why that is and i think one of the reasons is that for whatever reason a lot of church leaders felt it was it was better to suspend their critical faculties now, now, whether that was because they felt, well, the experts know best or whether they felt, well, we, we have a duty to obey the government, we need to do what the government says. But, but I, I do think that they suspended their critical faculties for whatever reason. And, and it seems to me that when you suspend your critical faculties, then actually you lose your moral compass. Mm. Uh, and, and I think those, 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 those two things, I mean, I've been amazed at the silence of churches on on church leaders on some of the things that were imposed even at an earlier stage in this whole process. 
you know, where where loved ones were denied the opportunity to sit at the side of the bedside of their dying relatives, all those kinds of things. Those are moral, ethical issues which were not challenged. And in this situation that we're discussing today, they're not being challenged either. I mean, as I said, we span the two jurisdictions of the United Kingdom and Republic of Ireland. I, I don't think I've heard any church leaders speak about what the government of the Republic has introduced in terms of vaccine passports being required for indoor hospitality. I haven't heard about that. And, 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 I, and I came across, I, mean, I, I don't know how, the other day I was reading something, and uh, it, it referred to, to Francis Schaeffer's book, which he wrote back in the mid-1970s, called How Shall We Then Think? And, and, and I, I was looking to see whether you could kind of get it online. And yes, you, you can still buy it just about. But I, I read through a summary of it and it was immensely prophetic. I mean, it takes up what you were saying, Paul. He was somebody who actually was able to see where, where things were going. And, and towards the end, he said, he said, that, he said this, and, and it's worth reflecting on. He said, if we as Christians do not speak out as authoritarian governments grow from within or come from outside, Eventually, we or our children will be the enemy of society and the state. No truly authoritarian government can tolerate those who have a real absolute by which to judge its arbitrary absolutes and who speak out and act upon that absolute. Mm. And if there was ever a word to church leaders, I mean, that's it. Whether, whether that authoritarianism is coming from within or coming from outside, if, if, if we don't actually speak out against that as church leaders, then as he says, eventually we or our children will be the enemy, both of society, they'll turn against us, and of the state. And it seems to me the seeds of that are, are, are there in this, in this present uh, situation. Is there, is there an issue here that the church has, um, for whatever reason, maybe not bad reasons, uh, thought of itself as, as part of the establishment, or at least sort of um, able to get along with the establishment without any real difficulty mm -hmm. and that that relationship between the church and the establishment is changing and that therefore church leaders need to start thinking about that relationship differently. I think that is definitely the case and I think it's it's a very difficult thing for um, particularly older people in our in our country who have lived most of their life uh, w within the church where there's been a relative alignment between uh, the moral outlook uh, of the Christian church and, and that of the state, because our state, uh, our country has been so heavily shaped by Christianity, its institutions, its government, its laws and, uh, and so on. But I think what's been happening in recent years, and it's accelerating, is that um, there's a huge divergence there, isn't it? And the, the outlook, the worldview of those within the Christian church uh, is now extremely divergent from the worldview of everybody else around us. And I think there are many within the church who just who haven't really realized that yet. And there's a cognitive dissonance there. They just don't quite know how to how to deal with it. I mean, you see it, for example, particularly with older people and their attitude to um, the BBC News. Uh, there's a whole generation or two that um, trust the BBC, take take uh, what it says as, as gospel truth. Um, because a long time ago, uh, there was much more of that. Uh, but that's changed enormously. The ideology behind not just the BBC, but most broadcasters is now vastly different in its outlook, in its worldview. And so I think that um, that's been a real problem in our country. Whereas if you look to um, the Christian church today in the former Soviet countries, Czechoslovakia, um, Romania, Poland, Hungary, these sorts of places, uh, you find people have a very, very different view indeed. That's why um, uh, Rod Dreher's excellent book, Live Not By Lies, I think is, is a central reading for uh, Western Christians today because the first half of his book is, is arguing that um, a kind of soft totalitarianism is now the prevailing uh, ideology in, in, in the Western world. Um, uh, totalitarianism is not just authoritarianism, but uh, he quotes from... Um, Hannah Arendt, who's the, who's the foremost scholar in, in, in totalitarianism, and, and she says that a, a totalitarian state is one in which an ideology seeks to displace all prior traditions and institutions with the goal uh, of bringing all aspects of society under control of that ideology. 
A totalitarian state is one that aspires to nothing less than defining and controlling reality, that truth is whatever the rulers decide it is. And for rulers, put governments, elites, uh, broadcasters, uh, uh, and so on. And I think that is, that is true. That is, that is where we are now. Um, in the second half of his book, in trying to ask, how does the church respond to this? He has to go exclusively to those who lived under the, the hard, uh, harsh totalitarianism of, uh, of the Soviet era uh, and to a Christian church that sees their role and their relationship with the state as being very, very different indeed because they lived through a completely different uh, situation. And so I think that um, uh, our problem is <laughs> we've never had it so good for so long. Mm. Um, nobody can remember the Second World War. My father's generation fought in the Second World War. I was born just 20 years after the end of the war. It was still in the consciousness of people. The whole, the whole view of things was very, very different, but, but hardly anybody can remember that now. And, and, and we've grown soft. Um, and we need to listen to the voices of those uh, from the Christian church in other parts of the world who I think um, are much more able to help us with our future uh, because they can remember and can articulate what happened in their past. And uh, I think that's just the reality of where we are today. Yeah, there's, there's, I think, a sort of corollary of that as well, is that we have this, we live with this assumption that politicians and indeed scientists are not only sort of, they not only have technical ep expertise, but they also have a kind of moral authority as well. And I think um, personally that we're seeing, we're seeing, or at least, we, we might see, or we should see the breakdown of that assumption, um, because really we can see that there is a great divergence between the, the kind of moral framework, if you like, of politicians, Boris Johnson, Matt Hancock, Michael Goh, for example, and uh, what we might consider to be a, um, a Christian outlook. Um, it's not, you know, it's not an attempt to be judgmental. It's just an observation that there's a significant difference there now. And so there's this assumption that we've been living with that these people who are in positions of authority are not only authoritative in a technical sense, but also in a moral sense as well. And I think we need to uh, challenge that assumption. And one of the things I think we need to discover or rediscover as a church is our role. I mean, Paul, you said this earlier of, 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 um, of having a prophetic voice in society, having having something to say about moral and ethical issues. I know I've used this image before, but when I was younger, I was told that the church is not a, uh, a thermometer, but it's a it's a thermostat. You know, and I think we 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 need to rediscover that 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 idea that the church has actually a moral voice. It's got a prophetic voice to speak into the culture, and uh, if the if these if these issues are not um, relevant for the church and it's hard to think of any that actually could be as well um, before we move on to talk about uh, the church specifically um, William uh, in our correspondence you mentioned that you might want to say something about the issue of uh, children's vaccination as a kind of uh, relevance uh, issue though not something that's dealt with um, specifically in the letter do you want to say something about that now well it's really just an extension of all the things that we've been We've been seeing already um, about uh, about coercion, about informed consent, and uh, and and so on. And I think I think there are legitimate, real concerns and worries um, about giving medical treatments, um, which uh, which really will be of no benefit whatsoever, almost zero benefit, absolutely minimal, minuscule benefit potentially. To the recipients of that treatment um, on the basis that well it will help other people generally um, and I think when you're doing that um, to children uh, in order to um, apparently um, allegedly make the situation better for adults I think that is particularly uh, reprehensible really it's just not something that we've ever considered before children are uh, are, are, are there to be shielded, protected, and looked after by adults, not to be used as human shields. I mean, you know, we quite rightly, don't we, um, we, we think it reprehensible when terrorist groups um, set up their bases and surround themselves by homes of women and children, um, so that if they get attacked, you know, they'll be able to um, show charred bodies of women and children. Well, 
in some ways, doing something like this is 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 not so different. Um, I mean, I'm you know I'm using that just to make the point starkly. But what kind of society do we want to be? I mean, even if it were true that vaccinating children um, was a benefit to all the rest of society, and I've already demonstrated that it, that that it just isn't. Uh, it's medically illogical. But even if that were true. Um, I think there would still be enormous difficulties with it. Uh, and the fact is, we know that children are not affected seriously uh, by this illness. So, you know, what next is what I want to ask. Um, and what will happen when we do, I hope we don't, but if we do see uh, children, young children, um, who have bad and perhaps lifelong side effects from these effects, because every single medical treatment has potential side effects. Every single one, there is no treatment and there is no vaccine that has never caused uh, any side effects, no matter how safe it is. And you know, the fact is, you cannot deny that we have no long-term safety data on these vaccines. We just do not have it. And nobody can, to say anything other than that, to say that these things are completely safe for children as some um, uh, high profile academics have done, I'm afraid is, is downright deceitful, is dishonest. Um, it is a lie. Uh, we cannot say that. And so I think that's a, uh, that is a real problem. Mm -hmm. I think we also are in danger of putting a burden of guilt upon uh, young people mm -hmm. and, and children, you know, that yeah. if you, know, you needed to do this to to you know, to protect your mother and father, or protect your granny yeah. and, and granddad, but you know, where where does that stop? I mean, you know, if if if, if, a, if a child is at school during the winter, and and picks up some kind of bug, and they're being looked after perhaps by their grandmother after school, and the grandmother then picks up that same, you know, bug, and in her case, you know, it, it becomes a serious chest infection, and turns to pneumonia. Uh, ends up in hospital and perhaps dies. It is 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 the, her grandchild then to be um, mm -hmm. accused in, in in some perverse way of having caused her death? Mm -hmm. be, be, because that's where the, where the logic of this 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 goes. Um, uh, and and I don't think people often have thought through um, the, the 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 almost the illogicality of that of that position. We trot out these slogans: "Oh, we have to do this to protect so and so. We have to do this to protect so and so." And as the older people we need to be concerned about, but 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 you can't you cannot I think pursue that argument because you will end up in the situation that I've described, where where children will be will be will be bearing this this burden of guilt, which they should never have to bear. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. OK, let's move on to talk about the final issue that we deal with in the letter, which is, of course, how this situation could pertain to the church uh, specifically. And um, as I say, the um, announcements that were made in July said that crowded venues, uh, venues where people gather, could be implicated in this scheme. And so as well as being concerned about the broader society, we're obviously very concerned about how this might impact potentially on the church as well. And the, the way we put it today is that this is impossible from a theological perspective. This is something that would be unacceptable uh, from the perspective of the church. And indeed, it would be a contradiction of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul, let's come round to you. Could you speak to this issue for us, please? Yes, you know, the, the, the thought that um, uh, people would be barred from coming to hear the gospel um, because they've not been vaccinated, it's, it's unthinkable. I, 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 I hope and pray that no church in the UK would do it. You know, our churches are full of the vulnerable, um, the weird, the wacky. <laughs> that, that, that's who churches attract, isn't it? You know, so... Um, we, we have people who are very vulnerable within our congregation, people who wouldn't be able to even understand or comprehend the whole vaccination process. They, they found lockdown so difficult. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to think that we would demand proof that they've been vaccinated, um, it, it's, I, I haven't heard it mentioned in credits to them that, that vaccine passports would be introduced in churches, but, um, no church which follows the scriptures believes the message of the Lord Jesus that he is a savior for sinners. 
you look at the very nature of the message of Christianity, it is for the outcasts, it is, it is for the vulnerable, um, uh, it, it is for the addict, it is, it is for all. And so, yes, it's, it's utter madness that churches would be asked to bar people who've, who've not had a vaccination. I, I, I would hope no church worth its salt would, would even countenance such a thing. Hmm. And yet there have been reports already of churches in places having, uh, you know, one, one section for the vaccinated and another for the unvaccinated. Mm. Um, and, you know, even to see a photograph of that, uh, yeah. I just feel is so shocking um, that, uh, that, that such a thing could even be contemplated for anything. But then let's get back to some sort of sense of proportion for this particular disease, which now we know has a fatality rate in the range of influenza, which has always been with us and will always be with us. Um, and, you know, uh, although it is a very serious disease and can be fatal uh, for certain vulnerable groups, for the vast majority of people, it's just simply not the case. I mean, there was a very telling statistic came out uh, just this week in Scotland, where once again we have remained and in fact stretched the lead in about the only lead table that we actually come top of, which is drug deaths. And it's tragic. Um, but the fact is that if you take those under the age of 65, twice as many people in Scotland this last year died from a drug overdose as died from COVID, mm. twice as many. So, you know, that tells you something about the, the, the horrifically large number of drug deaths, but also the fact that this, this particular disease, this, this infection with SARS-CoV-2 is just one thing, and it is not the major cause of death in, 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 in any country today. Uh, and so why would we single out this one thing as being something that we would discriminate on, yeah, let and, alone and, anything. Yeah, absolutely. And just to jump in from that as well, this this also get, goes back to the relationship between the state and the church, doesn't it? Because it's essentially the state telling the church who you can and cannot have in, inside your building. And um, you know, a um, a more a, a far more reasonable view, in, in my opinion, would be to have a situation in which the church. Um, makes its own decisions about how to handle these things. It's not to say that you you wouldn't do anything at all about it, but it's just to say that it's a matter that can be dealt with. Uh, it can be dealt with in a balanced and, and proportional way, um, and not just in this kind of this sort of blinkered, uh, dogmatic way where the only thing that matters is is COVID. Um, there are all sorts of really serious theological issues here as well aren't there i mean um one <laughs> just to name one which is just very very obvious is that um jesus christ himself uh was was part of the reason he was so scandalous to people is because of his relationship to people with infectious diseases and there are multiple examples in the gospel of jesus laying his hands on people with leprosy and healing them making them clean as it were um, Matthew chapter 8, for example, um, Jesus comes down from the mountainside with large crowds follow him, following him. And a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hands and touched the man and said, I'm willing, be clean. Um, it seems to me to be highly problematic, highly problematic to say that the Christian church, as followers of Christ, we should uh, theoretically even ban people who are potentially potentially infectious from coming into our churches on that basis it seems to me to be a, a denial in 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 many ways of the very heart of god as it's revealed to us in the incarnation and um and of the message the central message of the gospel which is the gospel is for everyone it's not just for people who have been vaccinated it's not for people who are safe um but it's for absolutely all and so to have a situation where the, the church would close its doors to certain people, would deny people access, turn people away. I mean, it surely has to be absolutely unthinkable. Um, David, do you want to come in here? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think I could see a situation, Jimmy, which again, I would be very uncomfortable with, where certain churches may actually require people, you know, if they don't have to prove uh, vaccination, that they, they require them to 
prove that they've had a negative test. Mm. Uh, and, you know, for and for for and and to 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 me, even that is unacceptable for people coming on a week to week basis to 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 join together in 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 worship. Um, um, uh, but but I I I I I can I can see certain denominations, churches. Uh, move, moving in, in, in that direction, and that would 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 would, would concern me too. I think, mm. yeah, but, yeah, because I think it does open up those those. You you are actually you are actually then creating another barrier. You know, to people coming. I think once we put up any barriers to people coming in, in some way we have negated um, the gospel. Um, and I, I, when when I think about the, the the parable of the good Samaritan. Uh, uh, and Jesus framing that in, in, in answer to the, the question, who is my neighbor? Mm. Um, and obviously the twist in the tale there is that it is the, it is the Samaritan who shows neighbor love to the Jew. Um, but the two characters, you know, who passed by on the other side uh, and who passed by their, their Jewish compatriot, why is it that they pass by? I mean, I think it's something to do with fear. Because this man's lying there on the roadside, having been beaten up, left as half dead. And there's always the, the potential that the robbers are going to re-emerge and they're going to attack, you know, the next person who comes along. And, and, and so fear becomes the factor. Uh, uh, and and to, 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 to preserve their own safety, the, 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 the priest and the, and the Levite hurry on. But Jesus commends the man who stopped and attended to the, the wounds of of, of, the, of the injured man, put him on his own donkey, you know, took him to the inn, um, paid for him to be kept there until he was well enough. I, I mean, I think that's got all sorts of uh, applications in, in our situation as, as to what it, it looks like actually to, to welcome uh, people and, to, and actually to, 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 to show true neighbor love. True neighbor love is, is not withdrawing from people. Uh, it's, 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 it's moving towards people. And, and I know you can be accused of quoting text out of context. I don't want to do that. But, you know, the words perfect love casts out fear, I think, is, is important. And, 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 and if we're truly loving people, we should, we should, be, should try to alleviate that fear that has, has become such a factor in, in, in all of this. And, and as, as, an, as encroached into our churches as well, of course. Mm. I think also, Jimmy, the, 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 um, what you say is right. It goes back to what you said earlier about, about there being such a lack of um, a word from church leaders uh, in the midst of a pandemic, because to, to take this approach is to, is to exalt physical health and safety above all other things. Mm -hmm. The message of the Christian church is that the world has got things back to front, that, as Jesus said, uh, what's the point of gaining the whole world if you lose your life? that is eternal life. The message of the church is that eternal life is vastly more important than mere physical life. Physical life for every single person will come to an end in death at some point, but eternity will never come to an end. The message of the Christian gospel is therefore that the eternal is infinitely more important than the temporal. Mm. And therefore to, to go down this road of saying the most important thing is that everybody is kept safe is to deny the gospel. That's what, that's what you know, caused Jesus to turn to Peter and say, get behind me, Satan. Mm. Peter just confessed mm. him as the Messiah. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And, um, and then Jesus immediately says, well, I'm going to go to the cross and die. And Peter comes to him and says, no, no, no. Lords, health and safety, health and safety. You can't possibly go to the cross and die. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking in the way of God, but in the ways of man. And mm. I'm afraid the ways of man is what's been shouted from the media, shouted from the, the government, shouted in society everywhere today. And the church has said, oh, let's join in the shouting. Let's not be singled out. Let's not be uh, ostracized for being out of kilter. But Brothers, the, go, the, the, the job of the church and the job of the Christian teacher is to stand up and say, the world is wrong. The world is back to front. And listen to Jesus Christ. Stop thinking the ways of man and think the, way, the, 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 the ways of God. And if churches go down this road, we are simply denying the gospel. And, uh, 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 and therefore, we are worse than the world because we're going out of our light into their darkness instead of bringing them out of darkness and, and into light. So it is shameful for churches to behave this way. and We should be ashamed and repent. Mm.
Yes. Paul, did you want to come in? Just to say, the church has a duty to, to the vulnerable, to those on the margins of society. Um, we're to go into the highways and byways. It's, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, it's the sick. Mm -hmm. and, and so that, that those who are most vulnerable, those who are most on the margins, we would uh, say cannot come to worship. It, 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 it's just unthinkable. I think your point of denying the heart of God is is exactly right. Um, and to our shame, maybe so many of our churches don't have the vulnerable and don't have those on the margins and our kind of middle class havens um, where health and safety has become the paramount thing. I think that that is to our shame. Um, but this this is a, it's a great reminder, isn't it, that the 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 gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ came into this world to save sinners. And, and so um, th that is our hope in life and death. And it's, it's been tragic that that has been muted over the last 18 months, um, that that hasn't been able to be publicly proclaimed. And um, that is much to our shame. Yeah, absolutely. Gentlemen, we've been going for quite a while now. So um, I'll just uh, give an opportunity for any final thoughts from anyone and then we'll wrap up. Has anyone got anything they'd like to say just to finish off? I think just to, just to call Christians and church leaders everywhere uh, to have confidence in the gospel uh, and to pray, to pray for our leaders that they will see things uh, rightly and, and to pray that church leaders will actually lead and not just follow. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, William, David, Paul, thanks so much for uh, joining me uh, for this conversation. Uh, we hope that people listening have found it interesting and helpful. Just a reminder that our letter can be found at vaccinepassportletter.wordpress.com. Uh, vaccinepassportletter.wordpress.com. And we do encourage you, if you're a Christian leader of any sort in a church or Christian organisation, to, to read the letter and sign it. Um, and indeed, for everyone to share the letter uh, far and wide and we will be reissuing it to um, the Prime Minister and to uh, MPs uh, shortly so please do do that because your signature makes a real difference and so um, once again thanks uh, to my participants in this conversation and thanks to everyone listening goodbye <laughs>